So um, before I introduce the speaker, I want to bring your attention to a few events, uh, upcoming Midas events. Next week, Friday the 8th, we don't have a seminar. Uh, it's a break week. Um, and then March 15th, we'll resume. Um, the, and then also pay attention to November 14th and 15th, that will be the Midas Annual Data Science Symposium. And that's our largest events, uh, event of the, of the year. And um, I also want to mention that um, our seminar series this year is sponsored by uh, Walker Shimi. So um, now I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, Ji Ju, who is a professor in uh, statistics in LSNA, also a core faculty member of Midas. G has received his uh, bachelor's degree in physics in Peking University in China and his doctorate degree in statistics from Stanford University. And right after that, he received the prestigious, uh, prestigious National Science Foundation uh, Career Award. He's now also, uh, he's now a fellow of the American St uh, St Statistical Association, the Institute of uh, Mathematical Statistics, and he's also an elected member of the uh, International Statistical Society or Statistical Institute. G's research interests include both data science methodology and applications. For methodology, his research includes uh, statistical machine learning, data mining, and uh, network analysis, which he will talk about today, and high dimensional data analysis. And he also applies these approaches to research questions in biology, uh, biomedical sciences, uh, finance, and marketing. So now, G. Thank you, Jean, uh, for, for the introduction. Um, or let me just switch to my talk. Uh, okay, I'm actually sorry for keeping you here. This is probably the, the last hour before the break. <laughs> I don't know whether we are the last group on campus. Uh, so before I start, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, this is a joint work with uh, uh, Lisa Lavina, uh, my colleague in statistics and also a long-term uh, collaborator. And also two of uh, our um, co-advised uh, former PhD students. Uh, Ken Shi Li, uh, he graduated last year. He's an assistant professor at the University of Virginia right now. And also Yun Zhong Wu, he graduated uh, a couple years ago. He's working for a hedge fund company in Chicago. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so my talk is on network analysis. Basically, I'll just show some you know, simple examples where we can apply a matrix com completion, this technique, to sum up the network analysis problems. Uh, so first, uh, network data. Uh, network data, so like, you know, in traditional multivariate uh, data analysis, the data can be represented by an uh, n by p uh, matrix, where n is a number of data points or the number of entities, and the p is the number of variables, basically p features describing each each data point or describing each uh, entity. And for network data, this is a different. For network data, it's about the relations. And the network data usually it records basically, uh, you know, link information between different entities. And usually we record that using an uh, adjacency matrix. We'll elaborate on that later. So, so that's sort of like the data we have, unlike the traditional multivariate data. Uh, and also, like you know, sometimes we may have observed both, both the network information and also the traditional uh, covariates on each of the entity. But for most of this talk, we just focus on focus on the network data. Okay. Uh, this slide is just to say that you know, much network data is sort of everywhere in many fields. Much of the data we see these days, they have a network structure, and for a network, there are basically two components: nodes and the links. So, say in social media, in Facebook, Twitter. The nodes might be users, the links might be friendships, uh, the ecology nodes might be animal species, the links might be predator, prey relationships, etc. So anyway, the, you know, the point is that there are many, many examples. I will not really mention every one of them, but uh, 
just you know, network is very important and very popular these days, and many of these areas, they do you know, take network data very seriously and try to analyze them, try to you know, discover things from the network data. Uh, here's an example of a, a sort of you know, a Facebook network. It's quite a famous picture. This was actually created by an by a intern student at Facebook about, uh, I guess, eight years ago. And that intern, he took 10 million sort of friendship pairs and made this uh, uh, you know, out of Facebook database and uh, uh, made this picture. Uh, so I guess you know, the purpose was to illustrate how Facebook had impacted the you know, people connecting with, with, with each other. So you could have people connecting with each other like a smaller scale within each city, et cetera, but you could also see people making connections across the ocean, across the border, et cetera. So that's the, the sort of like, you know, the whole Facebook network. And this is the, uh, the, the, the uh, sort of the one person's Facebook. And you can see this person is Jesus. He was a PhD student in the depart statistics department, graduate uh, last year. So <coughs> this is uh, his basically Facebook friendship uh, network. So all the nodes in this picture are his friends. And this is called a, like an ego network. Basically, you take one person, you see who are connected with this person, and also what is the friendship, what is the network among these people, among this person's friends. Right? So if you take Jesus, these are Jesus' friends, and that's the friendship relationship, sort of fr friendship relationship among Jesus' friends. Right? Uh, and Jesus, of course, is not in this uh, network, because if he's in here, he'll be connected with everyone. Right? So we take Jesus out. And you can see like there's you know, some structures with this network. Uh, these you know maize and blue, these are Jesus friends at Michigan. And the friends he made here, and I think some of them are within statistics, some of them are outside statistics. And these blue, uh, brown, green, and the red ones are his friends from Mexico. Some of his you know, from his high school, some are from his college, etc. But you can see sort of like these nodes, they have some cluster pattern. Uh, here's another network. This might be more interesting to statisticians. This is a citation network of statisticians. Uh, it was uh, curated by uh, Jia Shun Jin uh, at CMU and uh, his, uh, his, I think, his former student. Uh, so in this network, each node is, uh, is a statistician. Right? So basically what they did is that they downloaded uh, uh, all the papers published in, the, you know, in, in four journals in statistics from 2003 to 2012. Um, and then, so they could get a paper citation network, but that's not what we're interested in here. We're interested in sort of citation relationship between statisticians. So we look at the citation relationship between statisticians. If two statisticians, one statistician cited the other, then there's a link. Right? Uh, so the network could, is directed. So do we have removed the direction, so it becomes an undirected network. Um, and this is now the entire network. We take sort of the, the core of that network. So basically people who have uh, enough number of citations. Um, and the size of the node is proportional to the degree of that node. Basically the size of the node is proportional to the number of links connected with that uh, uh, node. And there are some you know, names popping up, such as Peter Hall. He's uh, one of the most uh, prolific uh, writer of prolific uh, statistician. Uh, unfortunately, he passed uh, away last year. And also there are other people like, uh, you know, Rick Carroll, David Johnson, et cetera. These are very prolific uh, uh, statisticians. Um, there are some other examples which I will skip. So just, to, okay, so here's the, the notation and the vocabulary just to get this out of our way. So we, uh, the network, we know there are nodes and the links. Uh, and we'll use this uh, adjacency matrix, uh, uh, A, to record the link information along these, among, on these nodes. So it's an N by N matrix, and it's a number of nodes in, in our network. And the AIJ is the one zero binary variable. It's one if there's a link from node I to node J. Okay. So uh, if this network is undirected, then this A will be symmetric matrix. Uh, but uh, you know, in practice, sometimes the network may be directed, like you know, the original citation network, or in an email network, maybe I send an email to someone, but that person didn't reply me, so there's a direction in the, um, for the email, so the network could be directed. In that case, A is not, doesn't have to be symmetric. Right? And also, in general, this, uh, the link 
may not be just a binary. There might be some other information associated with the link, so that link could carry a weight, for example, indicating how close two people are. And also, the, the link can even have a sign, maybe indicating maybe either friendship or friend of an enemy. So, 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 so this you know, the link can, can carry information. Uh, but most of the time, we just focus on binary network with A being either one or zero. Um, so as a statistician, <coughs> we try to you know, use statistical framework to model the network data. So here, you know, for most of the time, as I, mentioned, as I said, we'll focus on the case when AIJ is binary, it's either one or zero, indicating whether the link is there or not. So we'll you know, very naturally, as a statistician, using uh, the Bernoulli distribution to model AIJ. And one very big assumption we make is that we assume these links are independent. So often this assumption you know, is probably you know, unrealistic, but it simplifies analysis, and you can treat that as a good approximation to the reality. Uh, the quantity that we are interested in is this the, uh, probability matrix P, so it's also an N by N matrix. Uh, each element is just the, uh, the expectation of uh, AIJ, that's PIJ, telling us the the, the link probability from node i to node j. Um, one question with network analysis is that sort of if we observe a, so we observe this network, and our goal is to estimate this probability matrix p. Okay. And if you think about that, this problem is actually um, sort of very difficult or not very interesting because for each parameter p i j, we only observe one observation a i j, so we can't really get a good estimate for for p i j unless we make some assumptions on the structure of P. So we have to make uh, some structure information on P so that this problem is, is interesting. Right? So here are some of the commonly used uh, or commonly assumed structure for the, for the probability matrix P. One is the so-called community structure, okay, which I will elaborate uh, uh, very soon. Uh, another structure assumption is to assume that P is, uh, it's, it's P by P matrix is of low rank. Uh, this is actually includes the community structure as a special case. So, as we will see, like the community structure has a low rank, or corresponds to a low rank uh, probability matrix. Uh, another uh, assumption is so-called a graph, form, which we will not really like, elaborate in this talk. But roughly speaking, what this says is that uh, uh, sort of like you can permutate the nodes in the order such that the probability matrix is smooth with respect to the n by n grade. Uh, so for the, 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 in terms of the community structure, the, the most widely uh, used model, or maybe even the first model, is the so-called stochastic block model. This was proposed by Holland, a statistician, and uh, his collaborators uh, in, almost uh, 35 years ago. And this is for undirected network. Right? And the K is the number of communities. Right? So, so uh, and we use the CI to denote the community label of a node I. And there are k communities, so we assume CI can take up one of these two k values, telling us which community does CI belong to. And we assume CI is a multinomial random variable with probability pi 1 to pi k. So the summation of pi 1 to pi k is equal to 1. And here's the key part of this stochastic block model. So what this says is that the given two nodes, node i and node j, the probability that the link, so the link probability between node and uh, node j only depends on their community labels. Right? So it does not depend on any individual characteristic of these two nodes, only depends on you know, which communities they belong to. And that link probability is equal to say B, C, I, C, J. So C, I is the community that node I belongs to, and the C, J is the community that node J belongs to. Right? And then for these probabilities, we have a K by K matrix storing these probabilities. Uh, here's uh, just a you know, very simple uh, demo. So suppose we have these nodes, and we have three communities. So k is equal to three. Uh, so we first randomly assign a community label to each node. So we get the community labels of each node. And then in terms of the link probabilities between any pair of nodes, it only de that, that link probability only depends on which communities they belong to. So, so, so we use we have a B using the B matrix, then we can uh, generate these links. Right? Each link is a, binary, uh, is a Bernoulli binary uh, random variable. Uh, we can also write this uh, stochastic block model in the, in, in the matrix form, so we can just understand the structure of that the probability matrix a little bit. So here we use this ZI. It's, it's, a, it's a vector with the k components. So it's a landscape vector. 
with only one element equal to one and all other elements equal to zero. So if the node ICI belongs to the case community, then the case component of that vector is equal to one, otherwise it's equal to zero. So this ZI basically is a membership vector for node I. And then we can put all these memberships of these n nodes into a matrix Z. So it's a, each row corresponds to a node with only one element being one. And then the probability matrix P, which is n by n matrix, can be written in this, this format, where this Z is an n by k matrix, B is a k by k matrix, the probabilities, and this Z transpose is again k by n. So here is an example. Suppose k is equal to two. We have two communities, and we have n nodes. So this is an n by n uh, probability matrix. Right. And it has this block structure, and this can be written in this way. So each row is a node, and we have two columns indicating basically the, these nodes belong to the first community, these nodes belong to the second community. And this is a two by two probability matrix. And so you can see this, obviously, this probability matrix P has a low rank structure. In this case, the rank is two. In general, the rank is K. Um, so the problem of community detection is then that we observe this A, we observe, we, we, uh, we observe the network, and our goal, that's our data, and our goal is to estimate this probability matrix P. Right? Uh, the problem is actually very straightforward. If we know the community memberships of these nodes, okay, so here's the example. Suppose we know, you know these nodes belong to the first community, these nodes belong to the second community. We reshuffle the, the, the adjacency matrix, it looks like this. So it's very easy to estimate these probabilities, right? just using like, like, etc. But in general, in practice, the life is not this nice. We don't know the community memberships of the nodes. We don't know like which nodes belong to which community. So what we observe in reality in terms of this adjacency matrix does not look like this. It looks like something this or this. Okay, so one of these two, one of these two adjacency matrix, one is a reshuffled version of this matrix. The other is a is a is a is a third or any graph in which that uh, all the link probabilities are equal. So there's no community structure, uh, but the, in terms of the density, this network is the same as the other one. Right. So of these two, one has a structure, one has a community structure, the other doesn't have. So because you know, it's really hard to tell which one is which just by looking at that. I mean, this is the one actually with the community structure. This is the third or any graph. Um, so this one is a reshuffled version of this one. So that's, a, and this is a data set that we need to analyze in practice. So it's difficult because we don't know the community memberships of these nodes. Uh, but the, so far right now, I mean, there are many methods which have been proposed to, to, you know, to, to sort of, you know, given this kind of, this, this adjacency matrix, how do we, uh, you know, estimate the, community memberships of these nodes and how do we estimate these prob probabilities. Many methods have been proposed and many efficient methods have been pro proposed, or scalable methods have been proposed. So that's, but that's not our uh, focus here. We're not, uh, that's not a focus of our talk here. We will we'll <coughs> actually focus on another issue, which is a model selection for network analysis. So right now, so far, you know, so that stochastic block model is one possible model uh, that has been proposed to analyze network data. And many methods have been proposed to, to, to fit the stochastic block model. And uh, actually, there are many more models have been proposed for analyzing network data. Uh, for example, even for SBM, stochastic block model, there are many extensions, including Mark Newman's, Ari Fimmer's degree corrected stochastic block, mo block model. But there are many other models. Uh, so we have many models. And also, there are other issues, such as that, you know, when we fit the stochastic block model, the number of communities is unknown, usually. So we have to choose a number for the community. We have to choose a value for the number of communities. Right? And also in terms of the many of the methods that can be used to fit the, uh, you know, the network model, they usually involve tuning parameters which we have to choose. So there's a sort of like a model selection issue here. That's what we will focus on, at least for the first half of the talk. Is that when there are many, many models, when there are many methods which involve tuning parameters, how do we choose which model to use? How do we choose the value of these tuning parameters. Right, so the first thing that come to mind is cross-validation. Cross-validation is, is a very popular, very widely used method, generic method for model selection in machine learning. But it's usually for the, the standard multivariate type of data, right, not for networks. 
So cross validation some of the network has been somehow understudied. And the reason we guess there you know, might be two challenges with the cross validation for network. One is the you know in cross validation usually we need to split the split the data into two parts, the training and testing. And we use the training to build the model, we use the testing to to compute some loss criteria and then select the model. But in with network data, how do we split the network into training and testing? It's not that obvious. And the second is that after we split the network into training and testing, how do we build a model using the training data? That's also not clear. We consider this might be the two challenges that prevented this people have you know, really seriously looked at this problem. Um, here's actually one very nice work which sort of motivated what, uh, you know, what, we, what we do. Uh, this is a paper written by uh, Jing Lei at uh, CMU and also I think uh, he's a collaborator. So they proposed a, a, a sort of what they call network cross validation. Uh, this is specifically for the stochastic block model. Okay, it's only for stochastic block model. So what they proposed is the following. So that you have this, you know, they run the network, they, random, they randomly select N1 nodes from the network and you can divide the adjacency matrix in this way. So this is the, the N1 nodes and there are another N2 nodes. So they use this part as a training part and they use this part of the network to fit a stochastic block model to recover the, 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 the community memberships of the nodes and the recover the probability estimates, et cetera. And then they use this part as a testing part to evaluate some loss criteria for the model they built. And they use this to select a number of blocks. Okay. So that's what they did. But this is, again, this is specifically for the block model. So what we were thinking is that whether we can pr use something more general not specific for the stochastic block model, but something which is more general, which can be applied in many uh, network models, or model selection for network uh, modeling. Uh, and of course, you know, we assume that the, the, the edges are independent, but the key assumption we make here is that we assume this the probability matrix is low rank, and this has been uh, observed with many networks. For example, for the stochastic block model, it has a low rank structure. The degree corrected stochastic block model also has a low rank structure. So many of the network models have a low rank structure, and many of the real networks also have a low rank structure. So this is the, the, the key assumption we make, which is that the probability matrix is low rank. And also our method will be able to be applied to both directed and undirected networks, and also uh, with edge weight, not just the binary networks. So here's the, like, you know, what, uh, uh, what our algorithm does. So it's actually you know, very, very straightforward. So what we did is that instead of splitting the nodes, like what uh, Jing Lei and his collaborator did, they split the nodes into, and based on the, the, the selected nodes, they split the network into training and the testing. Right? So what we do is that we split on the node pairs. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be linked, it's just node pairs. We look at all the node pairs, and then we split the node pairs into a training and testing sets. And then if we look at the training part, the, the training set is basically a part of the, uh, the adjacency matrix. So we only observe part of the adjacency matrix. There are another part, which are the testing, which is the testing set that we don't observe. So for the, for the training part, we'll use the, uh, uh, sort of treat that as a matrix completion problem. We use a matrix completion method to recover the full adjacency matrix, A hat using only the training part. And then we fit our model on this uh, sort of uh, recovered A hat, and then to uh, apply our model on the, on, on the testing set, on the testing part, and uh, by computing some loss function. And then we can do this for each model that we wish to compare, from, each, model we wish to, each model we wish to consider, and then pick the model that has the smallest uh, error on the testing set. Right? And then we can do this, you know, say many, many times based on different random splits, or we can do this in the cross-validation uh, manner. Okay. So it's very simple. So a key step in this algorithm is this matrix completion part. So for matrix completion, this is a, you know, it's, it's an extensively studied topic in applied mathematics. So the problem is that basically, you know, you know, we have a matrix, but we don't observe the whole matrix. We only observe you know, some of the elements in that matrix. And uh, we can use this so-called masking, masking matrix M to denote which elements are observed, which elements are not. Uh, and the goal is that we try to recover the full matrix A, A hat, such that it's as close as, as, close as you know, to A as possible. 
and there are different versions of uh, matrix completion. One is the so-called noise list version that you know, requires the recovered uh, matrix having the same value uh, as, the, as the observed matrix at those observed uh, locations. And another version is called the noisy matrix completion. So we don't have to require that uh, our recovered matrix having the same exact value as the observed value, but we can use some loss function. Sort of comparing this is uh, 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 the, the recovered matrix and uh, the observed locations with the observed values under some constraint on it. Uh, usually, you know, one so, so in order for this to work out, in order for this matrix completion to be to be sort of doable, we just have to make some assumptions. One assumption is to assume that they had its, its low rank, and also the, the the missing the missing part of that matrix is missing completely at render. So the missing mechanism is missing completely at render. And there are many methods which have been proposed for matrix completion. For example, you can uh, compare the, the loss of the of the, the between the the, the observed part of the matrix with the, the, the matrix that you wish to recover cons by constraining the rank of that matrix. And but this rank constraint is very complex and non-convex. So what people usually do in practice is to relax this uh, constraint by using some convex approximation to this, to this constraint. So back to our sort of edge cross validation algorithm, this is sort of like a perfect for matrix completion. Because well, suppose this is uh, you know, the, the, the adjacency matrix we observe, and we split these node pairs into training and testing. So the, these uh, um, red positions are the testing part, which we pretend that we don't observe them. And these black parts are the training part that we have them. So we can treat them, use the matrix. And because of you know, these test, this, random, this split is completely random. So the missing mechanism, mechanism is completely random in this, in this case. So it's perfectly for, 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 for matrix completion. And further, like you know, we assume that this probability matrix, which is the expectation of the adjacency matrix, is low rank. So it also sort of satisfies the, the requirement for matrix completion. So we can use some matrix completion method to recover an A hat. And once we have this A hat, we can fit whatever network model we wish on this A hat, and then compute the some sort of testing error on these uh, you know, red positions. Um, and in terms of the choice of the matrix completion method, we use the a very simple one, just as using the singular value decomposition. So now you have the you have this the, this, this, this 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 matrix with you know some of the elements missing. You do an eigen decomposition. You take the first k eigenvectors and the first k eigenvalues, and you reconstruct a, a matrix to get this a hat. And there are many other things you can do. You can maybe, you know, instead of doing the singular value thresholding, you can maybe, you know, penalize some criterion like this and the regularizing on the, on the say, the, the nuclear norm of the, of the matrix Q. Or you can do some like, you know, one beta matrix completion. This is specifically for completing a binary matrix. Uh, so these methods, they, in terms of matrix completion, they tend to do better than the uh, simple singular value thresholding. But our purpose here is not really to get a very good estimate of a hat. Our purpose is for model selection. So it turns out, like for, in terms of model selection, just a simple singular value thresholding is good enough. And it's very fast. It's much faster than, say, one bit matrix completion. So this is what, basically what we use. And also, in terms of the, the, the rank k that we use when we do matrix completion, we can also treat that as a tuning parameter, as part of the edge cross validation. So we can use use add cross validation to pick the, uh, the rank k. Uh, some theoretical justification why this works. Um, so under some, you know, under some assumption, under some conditions, we can we already assume that p is low rank. And if we also assume that, uh, uh, you know, the, the network is now too sparse, and also, you know, the, uh, the, link, the links are independent, then we can basically show this a hat, which is uh, the, uh, uh, the, the result of the matrix completion, sort of what we get from matrix completion. If we compare the, uh, the a hat with the true probability matrix, that difference is on the same order as using the entire original network, comparing that with the, 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 
true probability matrix. So they are on the same order. This means is that it, this A hat has the same concentration order as the, the original full network. So when we just use this A hat to fit a model, we should get some result as good as when we use the entire original network. A. Uh, we can make this more formal, but I will not get into the, the, the details of this. Basically, you can show that uh, you know the order of the difference between A hat and, and the P is the same as the uh, the order of the difference between A and the P. Okay. Uh, here's an example just to uh, just to sort of show the to demonstrate this edge cross validation method. So here we apply this to a, to a, to a, to what we call like a graph on estimation or link prediction problem. So what and uh, this is a, sort of like a method, again, you know, Lisa and I, we developed together with a former student a couple of years ago. This is also like a given an A, how do we you know, estimate a P? So we proposed a so-called, what we call a neighborhood smoothing method to, to estimate P. We don't have to know the details of this. What we need to know is that uh, in this method, there's a tuning parameter that will control, that will basically, you know, it's very important, that will determine the performance of the method. So selecting a good value for that tuning parameter is important. Right? So here we we'll use this, uh, uh, the edge cross validation, the method we propose, apply that to this tuning parameter selection problem to see how, whether we can select a good value for the tuning parameter for this neighborhood sm smoothing uh, method. Uh, so here are the two sort of uh, the networks we considered. One is the, uh, the, the stochastic block model, which has a low rank structure. Right? So that's a, a, with the nodes ordered, it, it, sort of like in order with these node, nodes belonging to the first community, these nodes belong to the second community, etc. And this is uh, the adjacency matrix, uh, again, with nodes sorted in order, but this is a reshuffled adjacency matrix where you don't see the, uh, you know, the, the pattern of the communities very obviously. But uh, anyway, the point is that this is an example where we have a low rank structure for the probability matrix. And this is another example where this probability matrix is very smooth on this n by n grade but it has a full rank. So it doesn't have a low rank structure. So we want to see when the probability matrix doesn't have a low rank structure, whether our method still works, because our method relies on the assumption that it has a low, P has a low rank structure. So here are the results. Um, so here on the horizontal axis, the tau, that's the, the value of this tuning parameter. Um, and the vertical axis here, that's the sort of like the arrow. When we use the when we use fix the value of the tuning parameter, we get an estimate, we get a model, we get an estimate, and for that particular estimate, we have an we have an error. So for the error, the lower the better. And then here we can see in terms of you know different values of the tuning parameter, the lowest error is achieved when tau is equal to three. And the, at the bottom, this is a what you know sort of, this is sort of like the selection frequency given by our edge cross validation given by our ECB method. So we can see that when the, the, the true probability matrix has a low rank structure, most of the time we pick the right, the best value of the tuning parameter tau. And on the right, this is uh, the case where the P doesn't have a, a low rank structure. And then the, you can see the best value in terms of the tuning parameter is equal to two. We don't get to pick that you know, because the true P is not of low rank, so this is understandable. But we don't, you know, sort of a, uh, do it terribly. So it's still like a reasonable, like the model we pick or the value of the tuning parameter we pick is still like reasonable. It's not like a way off from the, the best value. And here <coughs> we looked at this uh, <coughs> citation network of statisticians again. And here what we did is that uh, we didn't really try to fit a model. We just, uh, you know, we just uh, again try to, uh, again, Clustering these, cluster, uh, these, these nodes, clustering these different uh, statisticians to see what we get. Uh, we didn't use a model, like say a stochastic block model, the degree correct stochastic block model. We just used the spectral clustering. Right? So we, we given the network, we can compute the, the Laplacian. We do eigen decomposition of the Laplacian. We take the, you know, the, 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 the first k eigenvectors of the Laplacian, and then we do k means on those eigenvectors. Well, that's what we did, not without you know, assuming a model. Uh, but we didn't really like uh, work with the original K, uh, original uh, uh, adjacency matrix. We worked with the so-called regularized uh, uh, adjacency matrix. So this is uh, the original mat uh, adjacency matrix, uh, zero one matrix. Uh, uh, turn, uh, I mean, there are some like theoretical results indicating that if A is very sparse, working with A directly is not very ideal because A doesn't really concentrate very well around its mean if A is very sparse. So instead, people should work with the regularized version of A. And here is the how to regularize A. 
So this is, these are just the constants. This is a matrix with all elements equal to one. So basically add you know, to your A a very small matrix with equal elements. And the, the D bar is the average degree, N is the number of nodes. And tau is the tuning parameter that we need to pick. Again, like the performance of the spectral clustering will depend on the value of this tuning parameter tau. So that's the one value we need to pick. Uh, and also another value we need to pick is the number of communities, the number of clusters we, we want to separate these nodes. So, so these are two sort of tuning parameters, k and tau, we need to pick, and then we applied our ECV to this problem. And we picked, you know, sort of, this is the, the two values we picked, k is equal to 19, tau is equal to one. And then we look at those statisticians. Basically, we, what we did here is that we basically separated these statisticians into 19 groups. And then we look at these statisticians, we sort of like know them, we know most of them, most of the names. And the students, our students actually, they, they sort of look at uh, uh, many of these people's uh, like web page and did some like using some automatic approaching to download their research interests. So based on their research interests, actually these statisticians or these different groups can be very nicely categorized. So out of their seven sort of communities or seven clusters, those statisticians, they all work on the same, sort of, they all have similar research interests in terms of high, high dimensional statistics. Statistics. There are also three communities or three clusters of statisticians. They all work on Bayesian methods, etc. So basically, like using this, we get some results which are very interpretable. Like these statisticians in different groups, they can be very well aligned with their research interests. Um, so that's the, uh, the, the first part of the talk. That's on the, the, the cross-validation for networks. So going beyond the cross-validation, with the ECV, it's very nice in the, se in the sense that the, the, training, the, the, the training part and, I mean, or the, 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 the training part and the testing part are like sort of you know, completely independent, or like you know, the, the testing part are completely uh, missing at random. Uh, with many real networks, you know, we, many real net networks are not completely observed, but the missing list may not be completely rendered. Right? So the question is that, in that case, we have a network which we don't observe every entry, so there are entries which are missing, then can we still use matrix completion to help us? Right? Um, when the missing entries are not missing completely at random. Uh, we, you know, we haven't been able to answer this question in general, but there are some specific uh, scenarios where we can sort of like say something. And here's one uh, example where we can sort of do something and say something. This is uh, uh, for a specific sort of sampling scheme for the, for the network. So in this case, this is, this is a sort of, suppose we have a, uh, a total of a big N number of nodes. And the network is constructed through some uh, so-called uh, ecocentric sampling scheme. So what we do is that we randomly sample some, some, some nodes or some people from these nodes, let's say like a little n of them, right? And we ask them things like, okay, name all your friends, right? Or like a list of all the people you talk today. So basically for these nodes, we want to know all the linker information regarding these nodes. And then we can construct a network. But so here's a demonstration, uh, illustration. So suppose you know, we have a total of six nodes, so big N is equal to six, we have a total, and this is our total network, but we don't get to see that. What we do is that we randomly sample two nodes from this V, let's say three and six, right? and we ask, you know, who are your friends? So three will report two, four, and five, six will report four. So, for, so in terms of the adjacency matrix, for the third row, we observe everything, for the sixth row, we observe everything. Similarly, I mean, for the, it's symmetric, so the same for the third and the sixth columns, right? So that's the, the, the thing we observe. And here you can see sort of actually node one, it's uh, actually, it's not linked with anyone, but we, we sort of, you know, assume that we know every node. So this matrix is still six by six, so we still know, we know the existence of node one, okay? So that's what we assume. And we assume these, these three and the six are randomly sampled from the entire set of nodes. So the question is that, can we do something? Can we, you know, given this A, can we recover the probability matrix P? So here's the problem. So if we assume like, you know, these are the nodes we, we sampled, so we know everything here, we know everything here, we don't know anything here, and can we recover this probability matrix? 
again, we assume that the probability matrix is low rank. And it turns out like there's something uh, in computers and at math which is related to the, this so-called uh, CUR decomposition. And the CUR decomposition, this has been used for matrix compression in the sense that I have a very big matrix. I don't want to store this entire matrix. I want to just you know, store very little things, but which I can use them to recover this matrix later. So what they did is that they say, okay, given this entire matrix, I don't want to store everything. I would randomly sample some columns of this matrix, not randomly, sorry, sample some columns of this matrix, sample some rows of this matrix, so C will be the, the, the sample of columns of this matrix, R will be sample the rows of this matrix, and the goal is that I try to find a U such that given C, U, and R, I can reconstruct A you know, very well. So here's the, the problem. I, 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 in terms of optimization, we try to find X such that they are close to each other. That's the CUR uh, problem. So in our setting, you can think about like, you know, this is uh, the C, this is R, et cetera. So we just, you know, plug this in, uh, sort of plug, you know, those A's into here, try to get a U. But it turns out it doesn't work very well. It tends to sort of like overfitting in, in, this, in this case. So it doesn't work very well in terms of like recovering the probability matrix. So we did something a little bit more. So what we did here is that, Here's the, the, the main idea based on some subspace estimation. So here's the, uh, the idea like this is A1 dot is basically uh, this part that we observe. So under the low rank assumption, under the random sample uh, assumption, we saw the row space of this A1 dot should be very close to the, the row space uh, uh, of A because of A is of rank and the row space of this A taking the best rank R approximation, I forgot to mention, this denotes the best rank R approximation of A. So the, the row space of this AR should be close to the row space of PR. Again, this is due to concentration. Right? And then again, due to the, uh, the low rank assumption, the row space of PR should be close to the row space of P1 dot. And the, this, for this one, suppose we can get an estimated P1 hat. And actually we can get a P1 hat, sort of like the, 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 the row space of this P1 dot through A1 dot. And once we have this P1 and dot hat, we can apply that to CUR and get an estimate of, uh, of P. And it turns out this works like reasonable well. And we tried that on some uh, uh, like a real data sets and compared it with some of the, the benchmark methods. So here's the, the vertical axis, that's AUC. The higher the better. Horizontal axis is the proportion of nodes we sample, or proportion of rows we sample from the, the adjacency matrix. Uh, so red curve corresponds to our method. The other curves correspond to other benchmark methods. So overall, like, this method works pretty well comparing with other methods. <coughs> um, here's the, the, the last part. This is uh, also about the incompletely observed network. <coughs> it's again like a, related with the survey sampling. So sort of a you know, in situation, for example, suppose, you know, because many of the real networks are, are constructed due to surveys. Uh, for example, you ask, a, you know, students in a school, ask them to name uh, their friends. And when they name their friends, they probably would not report all their friends. But when they name their friends, sometimes they may, re, re, you know, name their closest friends first. Sometimes they may re, uh, name, you know, older, you know, sort of the people in the older class first. So no matter what, usually you don't observe the entire network. And here's actually an example. We have this actually example uh, due to I think Mark Newman's group. This is an example where about a, a hiring. So this is a, in this network. Each node is, a, is an institution. It's actually a B school. And uh, if a, if institution I hired a student graduate from institution J, then there's a link from node I to node J. Right? So how why is this network like incompletely observed? Because what did According to that network, you can see like a, this institution <coughs> hired a graduate from another institution, but you actually don't see all the offers made by institution I. Right? Institution I could make more than one offer. Maybe institution I made three offers, but two offers were declined, and you only got to see the, the, the person who accepted the offer. So you only got to see which person was eventually hired by institution I. Right? So that's also not completely observed. Um, so in general, so here we you know, try to 
accommodate the situation where this missing mechanics is the, you know, could be dependent on the network itself, could also be depend on node characteristics. So this could depend on, 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 on node characteristics such as depend on individual case. Different case may have different, uh, say, nominating uh, preferences. Uh, and different institutions, when they hire people, they may also have different uh, hiring uh, sort of preferences, et cetera. So here, you know, we try to propose a parametric model uh, to accommodate this, uh, what we call like, you know, edge nomination mechanism. And then we'll allow this nomination depend on the node characteristics and also depend on the network structures. So very place, uh, a very easy place to start with, of course, is the net model with communities. The simplest place is the stochastic block model. So we start with the stochastic block model, but this time we focus on direct networks. So this is a, 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 a directed stochastic block model. It's very similar to the undirected stochastic block model, except that that K by K B matrix is no longer symmetric. So in the undirected stochastic block model, it's K by K probability matrix B is symmetric. So for undirected, this B is just no longer required to be symmetric, it could be asymmetric. And again, we assume different links are independent. And here is the sort of like, you know, our uh, edge nomination mechanism. So we still uh, we assume there's this a network which we don't observe, the underlying true network that we don't observe. For example, like, you know, the friendship network of school students. And it's generated from a directed uh, uh, stochastic block model. And we don't see that, right? We only get to see the nominations of these students of each other to see an observed network. And the nomination mechanism is uh, uh, described by this R. So this R is a binary, but only random variables, either one or zero. If it's equal to one, that means like node I, so AIJ will, will be reported. So we'll see that. Or if it's equal to zero, then AIJ won't see that. And we assume this RIJ is a Bernoulli random variable and the parameter uh, for A, uh, or the probability for RIJ equal to one looks like this. So theta I tries to capture the, the, the individual characteristic of the student I or node I. Right? This tells you like a sort of like a nominating intensity, like the, it's like a propensity score for how likely this, uh, this student you know, nominates his friends. Right? Some students might be lazy when you ask the, them, who are your friends? I don't like to report anyone. Right? So that's uh, the theta I value will be low. But if it's a very active student, when you ask him who are your friends, he wants to tell you all his friends, then the state I value will be large. Right? This is sort of like the degree parameter in humans degree corrected block model. And then this, uh, and, and I have another parameter, lambda I. This is trying to capture the individual preference for communities from which a student would nominate. Right? So basically when you ask a student to nominate a friend, the student may have different preferences for different groups I belong to. For the student belonging to my same group, I may like to nominate them. But for another student who is uh, in a higher grade than me, I may not like to nominate them. In that case, so the lambda i value will reflect that. Okay? So if lambda i value is large, that means maybe I like to nominate friends in my group. But if uh, lambda i value is small, that means you know, I, um, I like to nominate friends from a different group. So that's uh, 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 the nominating mechanism captured by this RIJ. And overall, so we, uh, we observe this A tilde. Right? So A tilde is just a multiplication of AIJ and RIJ. If RIJ is equal to one, then we observe AIJ. If RIJ is equal to zero, we don't observe AIJ. So we observe this AIJ tilde. And because of all the assumptions we made, the probability that AIJ tilde is equal to one can be written just in this way. Um, and then, you know, so we did a lot of work, at the technical stuff, like, you know, we need to, okay, this model just by this is not really like identifiable, so we have to come up with some conditions for identifiability. And in terms of fitting the model, fitting the model meaning like a fitting, you know, uh, identifying these C1 to CN, which communities each node belong to, and also estimating theta i, uh, lambda i, and also these probabilities, BCI, CJ, in terms of estimating these parameters. So we have come up with a, with a combined uh, uh, method. We first do spectral clustering on the right. So, so for this model, the probability matrix is still of low rank. 
So we can do spectral clustering on the right singular vectors to identify the C1 to C and to identify the community labels of each node, and then follow the bio method of, mo method of moments method to estimate the values of these parameters, theta, including theta i, b, c, i, c, j, and the lambda i. And we could also you know, show some theoretical properties for our method to show some consistency, meaning that we can recover those community labels um, you know, very well, and we can also estimate those parameters very well. Um, and then, so we applied that to this data set. This data set was uh, curated by uh, Closet um, and her collaborators. This is, uh, so in this, in this network, each node is, uh, is, is a USB school. Right? And uh, uh, it's directed, right? So if one B school hired another, if one B school hired a, a graduate from another B school, then there's a link from node I to node J. Right? And this is actually weighted because uh, 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 there are three possible values for each link, zero, one, and two. So there are one meaning like school I just hired exactly one student from the other school. And the, I mean, school I could hire more than one student from another school. And if it's, beyond, if it's above two, we just set them O equal to two. So we only consider three values in terms of the edge weight. And you can also see there are some self loops. One school could also hire you know, a graduate from itself. So there are also like self loops here. Again, like the, the size of the node is proportional to the, to the number of links of that node. Um, so we can see like University of Michigan here right in the middle. Uh, anyway, so, so for that, uh, that work, we have 87 nodes, and it's the meaning of the, uh, of, the, of the links. And again, we use the ECV, which we talked about first, to select the number of communities. And we fit, uh, I use a spectral clustering and the method of moment to fit you know, our model to this network. And here's what we found. We found, like, you know, we use ECV to identify there are four communities. So, uh, so this is the, the number of B schools in the first community, et cetera. Um, so I, we didn't list the O12 schools here. We just lit, uh, listed the top 10, sort of. Uh, uh, this pi ranking was proposed uh, uh, by Closet in this paper. It's a, it's, a, it's a method they come up to sort of rank these B schools in terms of their hiring advantage. Right? So for all the B schools in the first group, we take the, the mean and also median of the pi ranking of these B schools. Right? And then here on, on, on the second column, these are the sort of uh, the rankings of these B schools according to US news right? and of these four groups. So you can sort of see like they, they, these two columns, they line up pretty well. Right? So this uh, indicating that uh, these, these, these communities we identify sort of you know, align very well, pretty well with this, uh, this uh, you know, US news ranking and also with this uh, pi ranking. Um, so that's the estimated uh, you know, communities. Michigan is in the, in the first group. And here, like, you know, because we have a parametric model, so we can actually try to interpret uh, you know, the results more than, say, a non-parametric method. So here, what we looked at is we look at the sort of the group connections and different use this, just as the number of, it's sort of on average the number of, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's not like a probability, but it's a, because here like a, the weights are zero, one, and two, so the maximum can be two, not just a, a probability. But it gives you some like a link, uh, sort of a connection, uh, like a um, connection strength between different groups. Right? So here what we can see is that, uh, just say based on the first row, we can see that the, for B schools in the first group, they like to also just hire students from the same group, from, from, from the, also from group one. And the less likely to hire uh, graduates from the second group, and the very unlikely to hire graduates from the fourth group. Right? And then similarly for the second group, these two are similar. Um, you know, they're more likely to hire graduates from the fourth group, more than the first group, but still like a very, you know, the value is very low. While for the uh, third group, it's actually interesting, the first, for the third group, actually, they, they, they prefer to hire graduates from the second group than graduates from the first group. Maybe under the consideration that it's not easy or difficult for them to actually, you know, to really, you know, hire someone successfully from the first group, so they actually prefer to hire graduates from the second group. So, but I mean, in any case, what this shows a clear like a hierarchy in terms of, you know, hiring uh, among these different B schools. 
Um, and we also have this lambda i parameter, which we can we have like our model indicating sort of like the, for each individual school, what's their preference in terms of uh, uh, sort of hiring from the same, same, same community, from the same group, right? hiring like graduates from uh, schools from the same group. Uh, and here we can see that sort of uh, Yale has the uh, largest uh, lambda value, meaning that uh, Yale like really just wants to hire graduates from the first group, from its own group, rather than from other groups. Right? And the Michigan is here sort of like more flexible than Yale. Michigan probably, you know, is willing to hire students from both the first group and the second group, et cetera. So it's more flexible than Yale. So that's pretty much I uh, want to say. So just a quick summary. Uh, first, we proposed a, like a, a cross-validation framework for model selection for network analysis. And this uh, approach, this uh, framework, it's uh, computationally feasible and it's also very general. We just need to assume the link independence and we assume uh, the probability matrix is low rank. And that's uh, the assumption we make, so it's quite general. And also we have seen some sort of the matrix completion can be very useful for matrix analysis. Sometimes it can be just used directly, such as in um, ECV, the framework we propose. Sometimes depending on the missing mechanism, maybe uh, matrix completion cannot be directly applied, but with some uh, sort of tweet, we can twist, we can apply them to some specific problems like the, the ego-centric uh, sampling net, sample network. We, able to apply the matrix completion. And in terms of the future work, one thing we really want to do is uh, to see whether we can apply this sort of ECV idea to, to bootstrap. Because right? bootstrap is a very useful, very important, very powerful uh, inference tool. And uh, um, so far, uh, not much work for sort of inference on network analysis. So we wonder you know, if we can you know, somehow adapt this ECV to bootstrap, then that'll be some tool very useful for network inference. Uh, so that's all I want to say. Thank you. Any questions? It's 5 p.m. Friday, so. Okay, I guess people are probably ready to yeah, get please. out here. Oh, hold on. We're recording this, so if you speak to the mic. Have you guys considered extensions for when there are heterogeneous connections, so different types of edges between nodes, and how that might be impacted in a framework like this? Sorry, could you see that question? You mean like a uh, multi-layer network? Is that yeah, oh. they could reflect different types of n n edges between the nodes that are already in the network. Right, different types of uh, links. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, multi-layer network is uh, yeah, it's a you know important topic, and also you know it's uh, observed uh, in many real networks. In this work so far, we haven't done anything. Uh, but say for cross-validation, that framework, if there's a model selection issue with multi-layer network, whatever model you fit for multi-layer network, I can see at least this edge cross-validation framework can be applied. For example, suppose you fit a, like, you know, latent space models to, to, to a multi-layer network and you wish to select, uh, say, the dimension for, for, you know, for the latent space, I can, yeah, I, I can see this edge cross-validation framework can be applied there as well. All right. Thank you, G. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.